2 p.m. Eastern. That's on C-SPAN. The Senate takes up the supplemental spending bill after the House passes it. That debate expected Tuesday. Also, a bill reauthorizing defense programs and setting military policy. Senators meet Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Live coverage on C-SPAN 2. Marriage is the most fundamental institution of civilization, and it should not be redefined by activist judges. You are here because you strongly support a constitutional amendment that defines marriage as a union of a man and a woman. And I am proud to stand with you. This is C-SPAN's America and the Courts. Earlier this week, the U.S. Senate rejected a constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage. Next, oral argument on same-sex marriage from New York's highest court. They'll decide whether gay couples should be allowed to marry in the state. Currently, there are legal challenges to same-sex marriages in 10 states, California, Connecticut, Florida, Iowa, Maryland, Nebraska, New Jersey, New York, Oklahoma, and Washington State. This week we'll hear from attorneys arguing for gay marriage. Next week you'll hear arguments against. Judges of the court. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having any business before this Court of Appeals, held in and for the State of New York, may now draw near. Give their attendance, and they will be heard. Fernandez against Robles. Ready for the court, please. Samuels against New York State Health Department. Ready for the court, please. Matter of Kane against Marsole. Ready for the court, please. Seymour against Holcomb. Ready for the court, please. Soma. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. May it please the court, I am Susan Summer of Lambda Legal, and along with the Kramer Levin firm, counsel to plaintiffs in Hernandez versus Robles. If I might begin by giving the court a brief roadmap of how the four counsel for plaintiffs' appellants in the four cases before you today plan to divide argument and principal focus on the main issues. These cases brought on behalf of a total of 44 same-sex couples from around the state present the same essential questions. Whether the New York State Constitution's guarantees of due process and equal protection permit the government to harm New York's thousands of same-sex couples and their children by denying them access to one of society's most valued and important institutions, the state-created institution of civil marriage. I intend to focus on why New York's restriction of marriage to different sex couples violates the fundamental right to marry guaranteed under the New York State Constitution, requiring that that restriction be subject to strict scrutiny, a standard defendants haven't even suggested they could meet. Although higher scrutiny is required on this and, as will be argued, other bases, Roberta Kaplan, counsel to the Samuels plaintiffs, will focus on why the government justifications offered in these cases for prohibiting same-sex couples from marrying can't satisfy even rational review. Richard Stumbar, counsel to the Seymour plaintiffs, will focus on why the marriage restriction should also be subjected to heightened scrutiny because it wrongly discriminates on the basis of the sex and the sexual orientation of these lesbian and gay plaintiffs. Because the defendants don't even try to satisfy higher scrutiny, the marriage restriction violates equal protection as well. Finally, Terence Kinlan, counsel to the Kane plaintiffs, will address the profound harms inflicted on the plaintiffs and thousands of others like them because they are denied the protections for their families and standing that our society confers only through marriage. 
Ms. You'll Summer, just to be clear, the argument uh, will be solely a constitutional argument and solely a state constitutional argument. You do not argue for a reading of the statute that supports your view. Well, Your Honor, actually Mr. Kinlan intends to address that point. He will explain that the only appropriate remedy is to grant same-sex couples full marriage rights, which he will argue can be done as a matter of statutory construction, even without reaching the constitutional questions raised in this case. And Ms. Kaplan and I asked to reserve 10 minutes each for rebuttal following the defendant's arguments. If I might then turn to the fundamental rights point. Plaintiffs in these cases seek to exercise a well-settled, long-recognized fundamental right, the right to marry, which implicitly includes the autonomy to marry the person of one's choice. The decision whether and whom to marry is among life's most momentous decisions. To enter into one of life's most intimate, significant, and sustaining relationships with one other person that you love, a relationship that the state supports and sanctions in a myriad of tangible and intangible ways. Can I stop you there for a moment? Because you define the question as the right to marry, and your adversary defines the question as the right to same-sex marriage. That's the critical distinction, is it not? It, it is a, a critical distinction, and we argue that the defendants and the courts below ask the, the wrong question and misdefine the right at stake. This, this definitional ploy shouldn't deter the court from recognizing that the fundamental right to marry protects something universal. It protects, it, it derives from the protections for personal autonomy in intimate and family matters that the Constitution safeguards for all adults, central to the promise of ordered liberty. Well, how do, how do you know which is the right question? I mean, in, uh, in, in Washington against Glucksburg, the, the, the uh, appellant said, or the, I guess it was the respondent, said this is it's the right to die. And the court said, no, that's, that's the wrong question. Well, well, uh, uh, how, how, do you, how do you, what is the criterion for selecting the definition? Well, in, in this context, in Washington versus Glucksburg, the court was grappling with whether there is a, a fundamental right at all. Here there's been a long settled fundamental right to marry that's been well recognized. There's a difference between considering who same-sex couples have been historically excluded from that right and whether there's a right in the first place. The individual's interest in autonomy, in the ability to make choices about personal and family life that are central to what is protected by the fundamental right to marry is protected for all of us, including for same-sex couples, for lesbian and gay individuals. Although that's presuming that the use of the word married in fundamental right to marry carries a certain meaning then. It, it, it's Hist historically, it would not have embraced same-sex couples. But again, the, this court and the U.S. Supreme Court have never focused on whether a fundamental right that has been generally granted can be restricted only to those who historically were permitted to exercise that right if there was historical discrimination that excluded it isn't, one isn't it all, I mean, isn't it a verbal ploy on both sides? Isn't it all how you manipulate the words? That is, in, in, you, you could have, couldn't you f do the same thing? In, the, in Washington v. Glucksburg, you could say, well, the, you, you, uh, you have a fundamental right that you've given to people who want to refuse uh, life-sustaining medication. How, why can't you give the same rights to people who need life-terminating medication? and say you, you, you're, you're excluding some people from the exercise of the right. I, isn't it all in how you phrase it? Is there a real difference? Well, I, Your Honor, I believe that what's important is to consider what the courts and have considered protected by the fundamental right to marry in the first place. It, it, the courts have protected the core components of a liberty interest in autonomy in this realm, the freedom to find love with another adult, companionship, a harmony in living, family, intimate connections, intimate bonds, as opposed to the situation in Washington versus Glucksburg, where the court had to figure out in the first place what was the fundamental right being sought. Well, Here, the court had already said that there's a, well, had already said, or some people understood it to have said that there's a fundamental right to die with dignity. Uh, then they said, but, it, but, but not if you need somebody to help you. Uh, is it, that, is it fundamentally different to say there's a fundamental right to get married, but not if it's a same-sex marriage? Well, I do think that there's an important distinction. I mean, here there is a, a fundamental right 
to marry that does describe and, and support the same interests that lesbian and gay, gay adults have in forming committed bonds with another. In, in contrast, in what Washington... What case best supports your position that there's a fundamental right of gays to marry? Cases that support that there's a fundamental right to marry and that it should not uh, be defined to exclude gay people would include, from this state's jurisprudence, People versus Anafre, Cooper versus Marin, their important U.S. Supreme Court precedents as well, Loving versus Virginia, Zablocki, Turner. Has any court said there's a fundamental right of gays to marry? Yes, there are a number of courts around the country that... In Has any high court stated that, and if so, which? Uh, Your Honor, they, they so far have been uh, lower level courts, and we have the dissent of Justice Sachs. This is a, a, a question uh, that this court needs to resolve you know, as it needs to resolve under New York State's jurisprudence. What, what exactly are you requesting this court to do? We're requesting this court to give declaratory and injunctive relief requiring that New York State make the civil institution of marriage available to same-sex couples and all the attendant legal rights and, and protections that come with marriage on the same terms available to all others. And the court um, can do this by ordering a gender neutral construction of the domestic relations law and laws that regulate marriage in the state. In defining the fundamental right to marriage, is it your, your position <coughs> that we pay no difference to historical meanings at all? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, not necessarily. History and tradition have been important touchstones in defining what is a fundamental right in the first place. And that is why the right to marry has long been identified as a fundamental right. But where history and tradition shouldn't be used as a straitjacket is when it comes to figuring out who should be entitled to exercise a right that's part of the liberty and the birthright of all of us. We, we should not turn to history and tradition if it's been a history of discrimination and exclusion. And, and there are a number of cases that illustrate this. So we should, so we should pay no attention to, or we should not, the history shouldn't be dispositive here, even though the history hasn't included same-sex marriage. That's right. And if it were otherwise, then we would not have uh, a, a right of lesbian and gay individuals to intimacy and to make decisions about their personal relationships. So what is the history and tradition that we look to? You're not saying we don't look to history and tradition at all. Correct. I, I think this, it would be fully appropriate for the court to look to the history and tradition that has said there is a fundamental right to marry that protects an individual's autonomy and freedom of choice to make bonds with another in this realm, this intimate and family realm. And then the court also can certainly look to history and tradition of cases that have demonstrated. Well, we have that history here in our court. We have a history of, of um, uh, allowing for adoption. Uh, in matter of Jacob and, and um, redefining uh, family and, and Brashi and, and um, Levin case, et cetera. So we've, we, we've established our own jurisprudence in the area of, um, uh, of gay family life. That, that's exactly right. I mean, the court, another element of history and tradition that the court can look to is the, the respect and recognition for same-sex couples and their families that this court has shown through cases like Brashi and Jacob and Dana that the Why? state of... I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. Continue. I would say that, that the, and that the state of New York has shown in other ways in respect for uh, the rights of same-sex couples or, or lesbian and gay individuals to uh, be foster parents, to adopt domestic relation, uh, domestic partnership laws, and, and, a, and, a, and a respect and awareness that lesbian and gay individuals form families no different from others. Why isn't this a legislative matter? Well. It would be wonderful if the legislature tomorrow would uh, declare statutes that open marriage fully on the same terms to same-sex couples, but it, it hasn't. And the legislature is thereby depriving lesbian and gay individuals in New York of their rights to due process and equal protection, at which point this court's paramount role as, as guardian of individual liberties steps in. What do you contend the legislature has refused to do? The legislature has refused to 
enact legislation that affirmatively allows same-sex couples to marry. You speak of the fundamental right to marry. Are there any limitations on that? Well, of, of, of course there are limitations. The fundamental right, once a, a right is identified as fundamental, uh, the government, first of all, can still ha impose incidental uh, burdens. And beyond that, the government uh, can impose restrictions on that right if it can demonstrate a compelling government interest and that the restriction is narrowly tailored. Here, the government doesn't make any effort to satisfy its burden, and, and clearly the uh, restriction would have to fall. If we, fall. Were, if we were to find a fundamental right to marry a person of one's choice, then how do you maintain, say, bigamy s statutes or any of the other restrictions that we have against group marriages? Well, first of all, Your Honor, nothing in this case will decide one way or another uh, whether a, a claim to polygamy is one that establishes a fundamental right and has so, to. So, you would, does that imply that a claim to polygamy would be open if we decide uh, in this case? No, it, it, impl it implies actually the contrary, that, that, that it would not change uh, the, the status of a claim to polygamy. And, what, what is that status in your view today? Well, there, there is a, actually a 19th century Supreme Court precedent that upheld polygamy, but it's not an issue that has visited but, the but courts. But you, you, you can see that that's still good law? I. I it's a federal case, uh, so it's, it probably is a good, so law, you mean good you're, you're law. You're giving, me something, you're giving me something other than a flat yes to that question. I, 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 it sounds to me that in your mind there's some doubt as to whether polygamy can be prohibited. Hey, Your Honor, first of all, uh, I think there, there are two parts of the equation if there should ever be a, a claim to polygamy. And I just want to point out, you know, to give a little historical context, that the, the same argument um, or questions about polygamy were raised in the context of challenges to anti-miscegenation laws in both, both the Perez case in 1948 and Loving in yeah, 1947. Yeah, but it wasn't, but wasn't the response at that point, no, don't be ridiculous, polygamy is illegal and will still be illegal. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by the fact that you seem reluctant to say that. Uh, I, well, first of all, Your Honor, I, I think the response was we will focus on whether there's a fundamental right to marry that's being wrongly deprived from the litigants before us. And You're second, requesting I, a gender-neutral construction to our existing statute. Our existing statute only allows marriage of two people. Um, it, it also prohibits bigamy, prohibits incest, etc. And you're not looking to, to change any of those limitations. Absolutely so not. It's, it's I, I guess, though, if we're declaring a fundamental right to marry, we would like to be sure that we're not opening up all of these other possibilities. What is your answer I completely to that? understand that, Your Honor. Uh, First of all, I would say that there are two uh, levels of the analysis that, that some future court would have to do. One is whether, there, whether the fundamental right to marry, independence in making that choice, applies when you're choosing to marry multiple people. And two, if so, whether there's, even a, whether there's a compelling government interest that the government can come in with. I, I think it, it's, it's pretty easy to, to hypothesize that the government would come in um, if there was ever a challenge to the restriction on, on numerosity in marriage and say that indeed there are a number of, of interests that the government might assert were compelling that are simply absent here. Here, the marriage uh, restriction it is the only vestige, basically, of uh, sex roles that have long been understood to be inappropriate uh, to confine people's liberty within marriage. Does, does the position you're taking have any implications for the age limitations of marriage? I mean, suppose a state says that the uh, one state says that uh, uh, people uh, can't marry if they're under 60, and the other says it's under 17. Uh, and, and as you interpret the Constitution, would those have to survive strict scrutiny? Uh, Your Honor, I, I think, first of all, they, they might have to survive strict scrutiny, and I think they probably could. There are lots of uh, how can, strong how can, reasons. How can 17 survive strict scrutiny if the state next door allows 16? Well, it, be, but beyond that, as I said, the, the government can still impose incidental burdens on the right, and a delay of a year may be possibly viewed, again, this is not our case, may be viewed as an incidental burden. And there are also a lot of uh, significant government interests that might be taken to, into account in um, allowing you know, some more leeway there between a 16-year-old and a 17-year-old, where the, the government is very concerned about um, in consent and making sure that it is a mature decision to exercise the independent uh, decision and autonomy to enter into this special relationship with another. 
So another uh, argument that the defendants and the courts below, I think, uh, significantly rely on related to some of the questions today, it has to do with procreation. Um, they assert that the right to marry is fundamental because of marriage's connection to procreation and that only male-female couples with the potential to procreate sexually together are guaranteed the right to marry. And I'd like to respond to that at the outset to the extent that the interest in marrying the person with whom you have brought children into the world, with whom you are parenting your children, may bear on the right to marry. Plaintiffs certainly share that interest. For example, plaintiffs Lauren Abrams and Donna Freeman Tweed want to marry in part to help secure the future of their two young sons who were conceived in the relationship through donor insemination. But the argument that procreation is essential to their fundamental right to marry ignores the relevant case law, particularly since Griswold versus Connecticut established that married couples have the constitutionally protected right not to procreate but are no less married for having made that choice and ignores that marriage is about much more and why it is protected as fundamental. Summer, so uh, uh, Judge sorry. Smith asked you a few moments ago about other state high courts. Um, it, it's only the state of Massachusetts, is it not, that uh, has uh, found this fundamental right that you are urging upon us? That's right. The, the Massachusetts court in, in the Goodrich case certainly uh, had a, an analysis that identifies a, a strong and profound and, and some would say fundamental right to marry. Should this be a concern for us, the other 48 states? Yeah, I, I don't believe it should be a concern because this state is guided by what its own constitution requires and that is the, the mandate for this court as well. And, and I believe that the, uh, my co-counsel will be addressing a uniformity argument uh, in, a, in a moment or two, but what's really important is for our state's guarantees to prevail for these plaintiffs living here in New York. Have we found any fundamental rights beyond what the federal government has established in any arena outside of criminal law? Uh, well, yes, Your Honor. I, 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 there are several. For example, the Rivers versus Katz case, which uh, upheld the fundamental right of involuntarily committed psychiatric patients to re refuse uh, psychotropic medications. Uh, in People versus Onofre, the, this court was 23 years ahead of the US Supreme Court in identifying the fundamental right to privacy that shields the sexual relations and intimate bonds of uh, unmarried people, including lesbian and, and gay men. And it wasn't until Lawrence versus that was Texas. A, that was a criminal case. That, that's true, Your Honor, although I, I, would, I would just like to point out that the criminal prohibition on sodomy had severe impacts in the civil realm. And I, I think it's, an, it's, as the Lawrence Court pointed out, it was very important to lift those uh, barriers to make sure that lesbian and gay people could enjoy full uh, share of civil rights. What role does procreation play in marriage? Well, procreation is certainly a... a something that can be important for some couples and can motivate uh, or animate some of their uh, decision for why they want to marry and, and choose to marry. But is it, not, is it not part is, let me broaden it from procreation to children. Are not children part of the reason, a large part of the reason why the state gives a special status to marriage? Children are certainly a part of the reason, but I-, I Will you go for a large part? Perhaps, although I, I will point out that my co-counsel will be addressing that in a moment um, on the end of why there's not even a rational basis for denying the right to marry. But to respond to your question, I think it's, it's important that, to observe that there are many features of what's protected about the fundamental right to marry that don't relate to child rearing or procreation. And one need consult a, a married couple that's childless to you know, see that very quickly. We, we protect... I guess my question is really not so much why, do, do, are there aspects that are protected aspects other than children? Of course there are, but what, but is the, the... I mean, you, you, you make the point that a, the state gives lots and lots and lots of benefits to married people that it doesn't give to single people. Isn't the justification for that in very large part uh, d d uh, to preserve the proper... Uh, to preserve what 
the legislature could deem the right environment for the begetting and raising of children. I definitely think that is a, you know, it, a, it's a significant part of what's protected, and it's something that applies just as well. I'm not asking and what's just protected. I'm asking what's the reason for the, it's a different question. What is the reason for the special status, the special advantages given to, given to married people? Why do married people, why do married people pay lower taxes than single people? Why is that rational? What justifies that? Well, I, I believe, Your Honor, that, that it's, it's, a total, it's a number of circumstances. It's a desire on the part of the state to honor and protect the relationship that two adults enter into and any children that may come in that relationship. But there are many features of uh, what's protected by New York's marriage laws that, that don't directly in, in any way relate to children and are important to couples that don't have them. But beyond and that... As long as you're on that subject, how would that be... Uh, how would that relate to same-sex couples, that interest in, in raising children? Exactly. Beyond that, it, it is an interest that is fully shared by same-sex couples. I mean, this court uh, recognized in the Jacob and Dana case that there are thousands of children being raised uh, by same-sex parents who need the protections for their families that, that Judge Smith mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. every bit as much as others. And there's not even, as Ms. Kaplan will explain, not as even you, a rational... As you understand the Jacob and Dana cases, do they say, I mean, they, they clearly say that same-sex single people and couple, uh, that same-sex couples and homosexual single people can adopt. Do they say that there can be no preference for, for opposite sex couples? That is, if, 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 uh, if two couples want the same baby and they're otherwise identical, but one is a same sex couple, the other is an opposite sex couple, is it a violation of the Constitution to say it's better to give the kid to the opposite sex couple? Well, I think the Jacob and Dana case does say that any desire to preference heterosexual families over homosexual families or gay families would be uh, inappropriate. And it's so, so really as, not you, as, you, as you read it, as you, as you, you understand New York law, uh, adoption by same sex couples is not just permitted, but is on an equal footing with uh, uh, with opposite sex couples. Yes, I see, I see nothing and in certain, your And certainly if we decide your way in this case, that would, if there's any doubt about it, we would resolve it uh, in this case by deciding, uh, by deciding in your favor. Well, I, I see nothing in New York law to suggest otherwise. And it's not been the policy of this state. The defendants themselves concede that uh, lesbian and gay adults, same-sex couples, are every bit as fit parents. Thank, I do see thank you, Ms. Summer. Yes, I noticed it too. <laughs> uh, Ms. Kaplan. Thank you, Ms. Summer. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Your Honors. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Roberta Kaplan. I'm from the Paul Weiss firm. I, together with the ACLU and the New York Civil Liberties Union, represent the plain, or excuse me, the appellants in the Samuels case, which came up through the third department, Appellate Division third department. And um, your focus is what? My focus is rational basis, and I'm going to explain exactly what I'm, what I'm here to do. My job is to explain to your honors uh, this afternoon that neither the state nor the city of New York can justify the exclusion of same-sex couples from the institution of marriage. Now, are, there are several avenues by which you can reach that conclusion, all of which we think you should, but let me kind of explain the decision tree. Uh, the, the obvious threshold question here is what, what level of review the court should apply. Our answer is that the court should apply heightened scrutiny for three reasons. First, as my colleague- well, Heightened, but not strict scrutiny? Hi, probably heightened scrutiny, uh, Judge Smith, yes. Re Does uh, Judge Sachs applied in his dissent in-, in um First Department Correct. case. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, why do you draw the distinction between strict and heightened? Because I believe that strict scrutiny for the most part, I, don't, I couldn't swear to it on a book, but for the most part has been reserved for racial discrimination. Um, so first, it's heightened scrutiny because there's a fundamental right. Second of all, uh, it's heightened scrutiny because the DRL provisions adhere discriminate on the basis of sex. Third, it's heightened scrutiny because the DRL provisions discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. All right, can the, you... Oh, excuse me. Well, you're going to discuss uh, discrimination on the basis of, of sex, on the basis of gender. I'm, I'm not. I was just about to get there. Those latter two arguments, the t t t heightened scrutiny argument two and three, will be addressed by my colleague, Mr. Stumbar. Okay. Uh, what I'm here to explain is that the court doesn't really even need to reach the heightened scrutiny argument if it chooses not to. And the reason is, is because the exclusion of same-sex couples from civil marriage in this state 
uh, fails even the lowest level of scrutiny under either the Equal Protection or the Due Process Clause, which is called Rational Basis Review. Indeed, if this Court acts in accordance with the precedents it has before this Court, like People v. Liberta, People v. Onofre, and McMinn v. Oyster Bay, we believe that you will conclude that the exclusion of same-sex couples from the protections of civil marriage does not satisfy even rational is basis. It, is it rational? Could a, could a legislature rationally conclude, again, applying the low standard, which you say is lower than should be applied, could a legislature rationally conclude that on the whole it's preferable for children to have a mother and a father rather than two mothers or two fathers? Answer that question two ways. First of all, I believe that no legislature could do that. Um, I believe that the scientific evidence that's come in in this case, it's American Psychiatric Association, American Pediatric Association, American Association of Social Workers, um, all is universal based on peer-reviewed scientific evidence that there's absolutely no difference in terms of... Is it that there's happen. absolutely no difference or that, the, or that no difference has been proven? And the, the, I, I read the, the APA brief. All it seemed to say is that there's no evidence no scientific evidence of a difference, which is, is, is different from proving there's no difference at all. I believe that the scientific evidence that is in some of the amicus briefs, Judge Smith, actually show that as far uh, as the, the studies that have been done based on peer-reviewed competent evidence, the way that children are just, there is no difference. But what's, what's, what's the best study showing there is no difference? I believe, I think the easiest thing to look at is the American Pediatric Association's statement on this. I mean, who would know better? Well, I, 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 uh, I'd rather look at a study than a statement. If I want to look at a study, what's the best I, one? You know, I will have to, I'll have to get you that on rebuttal because I don't have it at the tip of my fingers. Um, but there's a second answer to your question, which is even if another state could, make, could reach that result, and I'm not willing to concede that it could and it would be okay or appropriate, but assuming another state could do that, this state can't reach that conclusion. And the reason is, as you discussed a bit with Ms. Summers previously, in this state, there is a clear policy that there is no difference. You, we are sitting here in this court today with the, uh, the lawyers for the largest city in the, in, the city in the state of New York, the city of New York, obviously. We are sitting with the lawyers for the state of New York. And in their briefs, they make a very clear concession. One, that children in this state are raised in same-sex families all the time. Two, that same-sex couples are good parents. And three, that there is no policy in the state of discouraging, in any respect, same-sex couples from having children. But, but, none, but none of those three things say that, say that same and opposite-sex couples have to be treated identically. It's different to say that we don't discourage same-sex couples, that same-sex couples can be fine parents. Well, I, I disagree with that, uh, Judge, because if you look at the analysis that you did in the Onofre and the McMinn and the other cases, where you looked, where you're doing rational basis review quite clearly, and you're looking at the people, the class of people who are excluded from the statutory protections. In those cases, you concluded that they weren't rational. And I have to tell you, the reasons in those cases were a lot better than they are here, given the state of the scientific evidence and given the concessions made by the city and the state with respect, respect to same-sex families. There are children raised in other kinds of family constructs. Um, you could have siblings, two sisters, who are raising the children of one of the sisters, and the legislature hasn't afforded those individuals all the same rights as, as a married couple, and they may have lived together for more 50, 60, 70 years, perhaps, um, but without a sexual relationship, but one of them had children and are raising children. Is that, was the legislature denying them due process or, or equal protection and denying the benefits of marriage as well? No. First of all, it can't be... So what, what makes this different? It can't be, let me, it's a good question, let me try to answer it. First of all, on due process, uh, there clearly, that would, there would not be no fundamental due process right there because I don't think anyone can really believe that a relationship between two sisters raising children is anything like the relationship between the appellants, the same-sex couples here. So it's just fundamentally different, I think we can all right, agree But the on. sexual component makes it, the intimacy level makes exactly. it different? The relationship of having someone in your life choose what's going to happen when you're on an operating room table and whether the doctor should perform a heart attack, how you will be buried, how you want to spend your finances, whether you want to buy a house together, how, mm -hmm. what choices you want to make about your children, physical intimacy, all those things. I, I agree that sisters sometimes share those, but I think we can agree that for the most part, the nature of that relationship is fundamentally different. So I don't think and the process would be implicated. Why shouldn't the legislature deal with all of those matters instead of this court? What is the basic reason why it cannot do so? 
a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, the cases, there are a lot of cases cited by the other side about that you should defer to the legislature. I'm sure you're familiar with those cases. To the letter, Your Honor, every single one of those cases, the Dalton case, the Port Jefferson case, they're all about economic regulation, welfare regulation, things of that nature. We're frankly deferring to the legislature and legislature experimentation is perfectly appropriate. Are you arguing that, you arguing that there is no deference to the legislature outside the economic realm? No, no, so no, no. social policy issues can't be determined by the legislature. This, they have to be determined by us. No, 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 no. We're not. It's deciding whether it meets the rational basis test. But it, under you, this, you, you're not saying that we have a power equivalent to the legislature to decide the contours of marriage, are you? No. What I'm saying is that under this court's jurisprudence, in matters involving how New Yorkers structure their families, how New Yorkers structure their personal relationships, this court applies the rational basis test with special care. And it looks very carefully at the rationales that have been proffered by the legislature or proffered by the state in the case of a case like this. And it looks to see not only whether including people in the classification meets whatever interest is being asserted, but it looks to see whether excluding a class of people but you, from but you, you would acknowledge that when we do that, we do that with some degree of deference for the legislature? I think that if you look, there's always deference to the legislature. I think if you look at your decisions in Onofre and McMinn and Liberta, this court, I don't think there's any escaping it, Judge Smith, looks very, very carefully at the justifications. Let me give you an example. In um, People versus Onofre, which is the consent, the sodomy between consenting adults case, one of the, there was a marital exemption in that statute. So uh, people who were married could engage in, cons in sodomy and it wasn't illegal and people who weren't married couldn't. The state in that case, very similar to the state here, said that an interest in that exemption was promoting marriage promoting marriage. This court took a look at that exemption, look at that justification and said it didn't make any sense because there was no reason why excluding unmarried people from the ability to engage in sodomy promoted marriage for anyone else. The exact same reasoning applied to the facts and the rationales here means that they, the justifications that have been offered can't survive rational basis. Well, it sound, it sounds, sounds almost like you're asking us to apply a heightened rational basis. I, I don't want to put words into, into the court's mouth, Judge Reed, and I can't, you've never characterized exactly what you do in those cases, but it's clear that what you're doing in those cases is something different than what you're doing in the Dalton cases, in the Port Jefferson cases, et cetera. And there's frankly a reason for it, because when it comes to issues like this about how New Yorkers live in McMinn, about whether people had to be related by blood to live in a particular neighborhood, when it comes to issues about how New Yorkers structure their personal lives, this court looks very carefully, very carefully, to see whether the rationales that have been asserted meet the test and make sense. And it just doesn't simply defer, it doesn't rubber stamp the way I would put it, the legislature. And there's a reason for that, too. Why is marriage essential? Why can't there be a union? Um, suppose uh, we said to the legislature, have a union across the state and not just in a few cities. Why wouldn't that solve? The problem. Well, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to kid anyone in this room, Judge Smith. If, if all the protections that are afforded to couples who marry are afforded to same-sex couples, and it's called civil union, I'm not going to lie to you. A significant degree of the equal protection issues would be resolved by that. And I don't deny that. However, there is also a line of cases that talks about treating people as second-class citizens. It comes up most recently in the VMI case, the Supreme Court's decision, where it was talking about. Virginia wanted to have a school for women that was going to be separate, and the Supreme Court said, no, 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 no. When it comes to discrimination, you can't treat someone else as a second-class citizen. Well, and so is this an argument for civil union or not? No, no, it's an argument for marriage for precisely that reason, Judge Kay, because I think if you were to grant civil unions here, what you would do is be saying to, to gay men and lesbians, and more importantly, be saying to their children, that they are second-class citizens. And, and that is why? something this court has never done. Why would they be second-class citizens? Because of the uh, word marriage and civil union? Exactly why would they be second-class citizens? I, I think that's why, Judge Smith. I think that, th that the word marriage, there's some of this in the record below. Um, some of other clients in the Samuel case had tried to put together all kinds of uh, regimens and contracts so that they would have medical proxies for each other. And while it wasn't civil union, they did everything they could contractually to make sure that if one was sick and in the emergency room, the other person would be consulted. And they didn't work. They didn't work because marriage, if you walk into a room and tell someone you're married to someone, that 
for all the reasons Ms. Summer explains, connotes something in our society and our culture that civil union does not. Even if you were to direct the legislature to um, enact civil union legislation, there are many benefits that uh, could not be enacted by the state legislature, which would, which um, are now inure to, to a married couple. Federal benefits, for example. Um, so it wouldn't really be, it wouldn't be a total. Uh, that is true. If, if we win this case and walk out of this courtroom tomorrow, it would not be a total victory. I don't deny that. The federal law, as of today, as of the current state of law, would not allow these rights. But again, kind of goes to the uniformity argument, Judge Sapera. This court has never accepted the fact that another jurisdiction, whether it be another state or the federal government, treats its constitutional rights differently as a reason for New York to follow. A after all, this is a state that has a proud and distinctive tradition of interpreting its state constitution in matters of import to New Yorkers in ways that are different. So I don't think that that alone would be a justification, and it really goes to the uniformity points that have been made. In addition to that, frankly, there is no uniformity in New York's marriage law. New York, as we all know, is one of the few states in the country that doesn't allow um, no-fault divorce. Uh, first cousins are allowed to marry in New York, so it frankly isn't credible for the state to come in now and say, we want there to be uniformity in the marriage law. There isn't uniformity. To the extent that you were trying to get uniformity only with respect to the treatment of same-sex couples, that, while it might be a legitimate interest, wouldn't be possible because the neighboring states, Vermont, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Connecticut, all to some degree of have statewide protections for same-sex couples. Ms. They Kaplan? They even have uniformity. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Judge Reed. Uh, is part of, your, part of your argument that the, uh, on rational basis, is part of your argument that the domestic relations law is hopelessly over-inclusive and under-inclusive? Exactly. That's a separate argument from the one you've been making? No, I think you have to, as to each interest, I think you see it both best probably in procreation or in accidental procreation. Now, let me kind of explain that argument. That First of all, there's the argument about procreation itself. You've dealt with that a little bit with Ms. Summers. Clearly, as this court's recognized in Jacob and Dana, and as the New York legislature has recognized, uh, same-sex couples throughout this state are having children. It's good for those couples uh, to be married. The state concedes that. It would be good for those children for their parents to be married. The state concedes that. So given the kind of fit that's required in the no fray liberative McMinn, procreation in and of itself doesn't work. So then you get to accidental procreation, which is the latest variant of this, this uh, argument. What that says is because only heterosexuals can accidentally procreate or procreate with minimal planning, although I have to tell you, I'm not sure I understand what that means, but <laughs> accidentally procreate. Uh, because only straight couples are in that situation, um, then it's okay for only straight couples or straight families to be afforded the protections of marriage. But that suffers from the same flaw, because if you have to look at who's not included, which your, your jurisprudence, in fact, you did it recently, Judge Sparrick, in the Levin case, mm -hmm. your, your jurisprudence requires you to do, then there is no, you're not helping any children anywhere in New York by excluding same-sex couples from marriage. And in fact, given the state of New York policy, given the fact that so many same-sex couples exist in this state, that it would be good for them and good for their children, I think this court could only conclude that drawing the line to keep straight families in and same-sex families out is irrational. Has, what is the has, dimension, Ms. Kaplan, by the way? How many same-sex couples uh, are there in New York State and children of same-sex couples? Many thousands, uh, uh, Judge K. I don't have the number at the tip of my hands, and frankly, there's a lot of under-reporting that goes on. Uh, it's one thing to publicly announce that in, in Greenwich Village in New York City, where I live. It's another thing to do it in other parts of the state. Has the legislature refused to deal with the same-sex marriage issue? And if you say yes, how have they refused? My understanding, Judge Smith, is that a number of bills were submitted, have been submitted to the legislature. I know there's a bill to do away with marriage altogether. I know there are bills. Actually, frankly, there's been some incremental, very piecemeal steps to, to give medical visitation. I know there's legislation pending about uh, choosing what happens to someone when they die. The, the problem with that, let me give you the best example why that doesn't work here. Matter of Valentine is a case that was decided by the third department. That case involved two men who were domestic partners, uh, one of whom I think was a steward on the American Airlines plane that crashed just after 9-11 out of Far Rockaway. And the third department held that because those two gentlemen were, could not be married to each other, 
The surviving partner could not recover uh, uh, anything from the airline, any kind of wrongful, and any kind of a wrongful death action. What's so arbitrary and capricious, and why this is not appropriate for legislative experimentation, is had that gentleman died on 9/11, had he died a couple weeks earlier in, in the World Trade Center on 9/11, his spouse would have gotten full benefits. But aren't, aren't, there, aren't, aren't, aren't there an awful lot of people who are getting who did a lot better because they died on September 11th and another? I mean, it, the, September 11th was sui generis, wasn't it? I mean, the the the, the, the country is full of people who who died in in tragic circumstances who didn't get the kind of benefits the September 11th survivors got. It, it was sui generis, your, uh, Judge Smith, and it was sui, sui generis because on 9/11, even even the people who on this in this country who are opponents to same-sex marriage, including the federal government, by the way, even they realized that it was so unjust to deny these kinds of benefits to same-sex partners that because of 9/11 they granted it. But they only granted it on 9/11. So only if you're a is it true as a general proposition that uh, whatever benefit was granted on 9/11 is required by the Equal Protection Clause to everyone else? No, no, no. But what the, what the point shows, Judge Smith, of course, is that this is not the kind of situation where experimentation is okay. You don't, the, it doesn't make sense for the legislature to pass a statute that says it's okay for gay couples to decide what happens to their partner when he has a heart attack, but not where his partner's remains if he doesn't survive the heart attack, should be buried. So, what, so, that, so, that does, that's irrational. What so, about the so, reverse in terms of legislation? Have there been attempts to, to ban gay marriages? There have been in other states? No, no, no. In, in our uh, legislation? Absolutely not. And that goes, I haven't touched it yet. That goes to the last point. Well, that also goes to the morality point. You can't really make an argument in New York that morality, first of all, I don't think you can ever make an argument that morality standing alone is sufficient under the rational basis test. Suppose we agree with you what follows. We say, okay, you've got to give a marriage license, gays can be married. What will be the result? the practical results of there, that. There's an excellent brief on that, Judge Smith, that I would refer you to. It was filed by the Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders in Massachusetts. And they talk about what happened in Massachusetts after the Goodrich decision. I'd like to know what will happen here. Well, I, what do you contend will happen? What I would say is exactly what's happened in Massachusetts, which is basically nothing. There's nothing that's been seen as unusual about this. There's not people rioting in the streets in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. There's not a breakdown of civil society in Massachusetts. And there surely isn't a breakdown of marriage in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's been treated like anything else. The state, uh, the efforts to have a state constitutional amendment in Massachusetts appear to have died. Public opinion is overwhelmingly in favor of what's happened there. So I, I would say the, the same num thing. What are the numbers in Massachusetts? I mean, what, are they bigger in Massachusetts than in New York? Yes. How, how many gays have uh, uh, gotten married as a result of um, that case? My, my co-counsel has been gracious enough to write on a piece of paper 8,000 couples. <laughs> <laughs> uh, numbers were, have never been how my strong How many will get divorced, Ms. Kaplan? <laughs> uh, my light's on. So. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stumbar? May it please the court, <clears throat> my name is Richard Stumbar of Bixler and Stumbar, uh, along with uh, my law partner and my colleagues uh, from Lapinto, Schlather, Sulk, and Geldenheis. It is my honor today to represent 25 same-sex <clears throat> couples from the Ithaca area who have been denied the right to marry for no reason other than their sex and sexual orientation. My focus here will, today will be on the discriminatory classifications created by the New York domestic relations law. Those discriminatory classifications are two in number. The domestic relations law discriminates on the basis of sex because a person's sex determines he or who he or she can marry. But for her sex, the plaintiff Ann Bell could and would marry her partner, Elizabeth Lindsay. The domestic relations law also prohibits same-sex couples from marrying and therefore it creates a classification based on sexual orientation. So we believe that the, the burden classes here include uh, classes based on sex and classes based on sexual orientation. That decision was made by the legislature. 
that the domestic relation law was passed by the legislature, I asked the same question. Why shouldn't you go back to the legislature and ask them to right any uh, wrongs? Well, I think that the legislature has been petitioned uh, to right any wrongs and, uh, in fact, uh, have not uh, acted on it. We have had, uh, 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 for a long time, uh, uh, since its inception, this uh, disparity, this burdening of, of uh, New Yorkers based on their sexual orientation. But aren't you asking this court to define what marriage is and what discrimination is in marriage? I, I don't believe so, uh, that we're asking so much to define what marriage is. I believe we're asking the court to compel the legislature to allow the institution of marriage to pertain to all New York citizens without regard to their sexual orientation or sex. I believe that these burden classifications have been created the way domestic relations law is interpreted in the state of New York and that they have created these uh, unequal uh, citizens and uh, it is the history and the province of this court to address discriminatory classifications. Were they unequal at the time that the legislation was passed or has it become <coughs> unequal only in let's say, let, let's say the last two, three, four decades? Well, I believe that the legislation, the domestic relations law, has been interpreted uh, as a law that uh, provides marriage only to uh, heterosexual couples. Uh, I believe that uh, there and you is say a, you say that was invalid the day it was enacted. It was invalid. The that day limitation it was, was invalid the day it was enacted. If that's the way it was to be interpreted. Uh, Assum yes. Assuming that we have a law in this state that says only opposite sex couples can marry, that is and always has been unconstitutional. That's it. It is my belief that that is the case. Obviously, there's been an. It uh, took some time to recognize it. Obviously, there's been an evolution in constitutional jurisprudence, as is often the case in various civil uh, rights uh, issues. Uh, burden groups uh, uh, have taken uh, uh, long periods of time to be yeah, recognized. But this, but this, isn't, isn't this the only one where you have literally the whole history of Western civilization against you? Well, I, I wouldn't say the whole history of Western civilization. I mean, it is, well, I mean Ms. Ms. Summer, in her argument, referred to a history of discrimination and exclusion, which I assume that does go back right to the dawn of civilization, doesn't it, that discrimination and exclusion? Well, I, I can't speak for the dawn of uh, civilization, but there is a, a brief, <laughs> there is a brief submitted by the historians which goes through the changing nature of marriage. Marriage What's is not- What's changed, Mr. Summer? What's changed? What, what's changed is the, the way um, gender is, so, is essentially a social construct, and marriage is a social construct. And the way that social construct is viewed uh, has changed uh, radically. Is it, is, it, is it a premise of your argument that, that gender is a, entirely a social construct, that there are no differences between men and women that the law can recognize? Well, there are sexual differences, but gender is a social construct, I would say. Uh, it, it, is is not, it is not, the fact, that, the fact that women can get pregnant and men cannot is not a social construct, is it? No, that is a, a, real, a sexual reality. And, and, and that only, and that, only men, the, 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 that the only way, well, maybe not the only way, the, the commonest way for women to get pregnant is by intercourse with men. I mean, that's not a social construct. That's not a social construct. That is a biological reality. It is the roles that people are put in generally that is the issue here of, of social construct. It is the roles that wife has uh, traditionally been put in which has complicated the matter and, and made life uh, in all honesty difficult for both men and women. It is the roles that women were put in historically for uh, such things as uh, the ability to practice law like the Bradwell case for example. Uh, those were social constructs and they have an impact on what the institution of marriage has been. Uh, I say that those social uh, constructs have changed dramatically over the years and we do look at uh, the roles of men and women differently. There are obviously biological imperatives and, and I would not speak even against those. Even our domestic relations law uh, acknowledges that uh, in economic areas, etc. Uh, the role, the judicial role of men and women have have really disappeared. Absolutely. We look at or via or. Obligation to support children, et cetera. That's right. 
uh, there's, an, there's an equality, uh, or VOR, uh, um, alimony as it was called in those days. Uh, maintenance now uh, uh, goes, uh, goes both ways. Uh, that was a, a case based on, on uh, uh, sexual discrimination, although uh, it, it inured to benefit of, I would say, both, uh, both sexes. Uh, what that, do we, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was finished. What do we look to to determine whether or not there's discrimination? Just the gender issue or what? Well, in this case, we believe there's two uh, classifications uh, of discrimination, uh, that the domestic relations law. Uh, I understood that. Yes. But what do we look to to either support or not support your argument? Well, how society is looking at things, our constitution only, what is it that we look at? Well, we are here with the constitutional arguments. It's true that society's uh, changes and the changes of roles have, in no small part, led us to this point. Uh, I, I would be uh, inaccurate to say that it haven't, but we are here on the constitutional issues, and we believe that um, there is a discrimination here based on sex because it is a straight but-for argument, but for the fact that uh, uh, someone, a woman who is otherwise qualified, a lesbian who is otherwise qualified, uh, cannot uh, marry, uh, it, it is but for her sex that she cannot marry, despite the fact that she's otherwise qualified. It's, it's that one element that impedes her from entering a, the, the, uh, a marriage which would be very helpful uh, and very important, the gateway to so many rights that uh, Council has spoken of. You, you, um, you concede that, the, um, that uh, the, the, ex the restriction of marriage to opposite sex couples, or do you concede that it doesn't burden either men or women as a class? It burdens men, men who want to marry men, women who want to marry women? Well, not as a class distinct from each other. I think it burdens both classes. I guess, I guess what I'm really saying is, does, does that restriction favor one sex over the other? Th favor one sex? No, it, it e equally uh, is deleterious to both sexes. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that, isn't that different from, say, Loving Against Virginia, where they, the facially neutral uh, prohibition on intermarriage obviously was intended to promote the supremacy of one group over the other. Well, that certainly was the intent, but the lesson of loving is how to look at a classification. Uh, clearly, loving is a racial case. It has compelling interests uh, beyond uh, the, the, the heightened scrutiny, which we believe should, should be applied here. But the, the other lesson of, uh, lesson of loving is that uh, to look at how classifications are made. In, in loving, uh, the argument uh, from the state of Virginia uh, was that uh, uh, both races were burdened equally. But that, uh, but that was, in, in, in Loving, that was clearly untrue. Wasn't it was it? disingenuous. There's yeah. no question about it. Whereas here, here there's, you, I think you admitted a few minutes ago that both sexes are burdened equally. Both sexes are burdened equally, but it's not the sexes that we look at under the, the equal protection jurisprudence. We look at the individuals. There's an interesting quote from Justice Kennedy in the JEB versus Alabama case, which was a case having to do with uh, sex stereotyping and jury selection. In fact, there's quite a few jury selection cases which are interesting in, in addressing this equal application argument. But Judge, uh, Judge Kennedy uh, in the JEB case uh, says, and I quote, at the heart of the constitutional guarantee of equal protection lies the simple command that the government must treat citizens as individuals, not as simply components of a racial or sexual class. I think that is the focus of the equal protection jurisprudence here. The, the, in fact, the equal protection clause itself says that no person will be burdened by the state action. Uh, uh, it, it is directed to the person. We talk in classes as a simplification, but is that in, it's that individual. It's the individual juror who isn't selected because that individual juror is a person of color or a woman. Uh, that's what's significant here, not the fact that the defense can strike uh, all the jurors who, based on stereotype, they believe are inappropriate for their case, and the prosecution can kind of neutralize the strikes of the defense by striking the, the other uh, a group, uh, a selected class. Does the state have an interest in promoting marriage between heterosexuals? 
in promoting marriage between heterosexuals as heterosexuals? Yes. I, I do not believe so. I think the state has an interest in promoting marriage, but not exclusive to heterosexuals. No. There, as counsel has argued, there is uh, no, not even a rational basis. If we look at the discriminatory classifications that are created by the domestic relations law, for example, sex discrimination, it's well found and well held that we should be looking at a heightened scrutiny uh, examination. If we look at a heightened scrutiny examination, uh, the defense here uh, has, hasn't even attempted to refute uh, or, or to establish heightened scrutiny. They simply uh, uh, focus on rational basis. And in fact, in the lower court, the third department, there is even a quote about what happened at oral argument concerning uh, the attempt uh, to uh, uh, the questions uh, directed to defense counsel about heightened scrutiny. What is that quote? That quote is, I have it here. Uh, it, uh, if the test being employed was not rational basis, uh, the um, uh, issue and under inclusive, the over inclusive and under inclusive nature of, of this basis would create considerable problems for defendants, a fact that defendants conceded at oral argument. Now, I think considerable problems was, uh, was giving, uh, uh, giving a little more credit than was due because the, the argument, at uh, oral argument, was. Uh, actually a concession that there wasn't uh, heightened scrutiny and no argument in support of heightened scrutiny. In the, in the cases from other states that have upheld either gay marriage or civil unions, have any of them uh, found sex discrimination, as, as distinct from discrimination based on sexual preference? Yes, there are several cases that have found uh, 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 sex discrimination. Um, there is a, the case of Bear versus Lewin, that was the Hawaii case. Uh, in Ray coordination, that was a California case. Live versus Oregon, that's an Oregon case. Browse versus the Bureau of Vital Statistics, that was an Alaska case. In fact, there was a long ex exegesis about uh, sex discrimination and uh, twins marrying twins, and uh, the, the opinion was very interesting in that way. Judge Sachs uh, uh, dissenting in Hernandez, uh, Judge Graney in, in Goodridge, and in Baker versus the state of Vermont. All of those cases made a finding that there was uh, uh, discrimination uh, based on sex. That right? Baker Baker rests on sex discrimination. Yes, Baker. There was a there was a quote in that in that case. Yes, that there was uh, sex discrimination. If if we agree with you, should we give the legislature a chance to act? A, a chance to make the. Uh, <coughs> I, I, I don't believe that there is a need, Your Honor. Obviously, that is your, that is your discretion. Uh, that's what happened in Massachusetts, and the legislature was found wanting when they came back with uh, a, 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 essentially a, a, a non-marriage solution. And I believe that anything short of a marriage solution in this case would not be appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kindlin. May it please the court, my name is Terry Kinlan. I'm here with Kathy Manley from my firm, Kinlan and Shanks. We're from Albany, New York. And it's my privilege to be representing um, two couples in our case, which is entitled uh, Kane versus Marcellade. For the past uh, hour, you've been soaring through the rarefied air of constitutional theory, equal protection, and due process. And I'm going to ask you, I've only I've only requested five minutes from this court. And I'm going to ask you for these five minutes to please come down to the surface of New York State with me and permit me to discuss the human aspect of our current state of law as it affects my clients, Bob and George, Alyssa and Lynn. I represent those two couples, and I actually have five clients here today. The fifth client, who's not named, is a little girl, age nine. Her name is Nora. And she is the beloved and well cared for child of Lynn and Alyssa. There is no better way for me to describe to this court the absurdity of the current situation in New York as it affects same-sex couples than to say this. I represent two men and two women. The two men have been together as a couple for 30 years now. 
and they will be together for the rest of their lives. The two women have been together for almost a decade. They are not permitted to get a marriage license in this state because they are same-sex couples. However, if Bob from the male couple wanted to marry Lynn from the female couple, they could walk to City Hall, get a license today, and have a wedding on Saturday morning. And that's preposterous. It isn't fair to them. It doesn't make any sense. It does not. It does you, not you say it's preposterous. Yes, Your Honor. Why, given our history of, quote, Western civilization, end quote, that it's been that way for centuries. Why is it preposterous? Well, Your Honor, I guess I spend my life uh, standing athwart the winds of history. And frankly, when we continue to do things the way we've always done things, we have many absurd results. We are evolving as a society. And just because we did something 200 years ago or 100 years ago or 50 years ago, it's no, not necessarily a good justification to do it now. I agree with you entirely. And in that circumstance, shouldn't we leave it to the legislature to deal with it? Well, that, that I'll, if, if I may, Your Honor, that's something I intend to address as quickly as I address in my, my second two and a half minutes before this court, because it's my position that we don't need the legislature that if we employ the rules of statutory construction, the well-known historical rules of statutory construction, then it becomes clear that it is permissible now for people of, who are members of same-sex couples to marry each other. Say we should just rewrite the statute. I think the only thing we really need to do, Your Honor, is this. I think we need to call our friends at the Law Revision Commission and ask them to clean up the language a little bit, because the reality is that under the New York State Rules of Construction, and I, I think it's uh, New York Rules of Construction Section 22, a gender designation can be treated either way. In other words, a, a man, if we call somebody him, we can treat him as her. Uh, if we call somebody a, a groom, we can treat that person as a bride. Are you, you, aren't, you aren't really saying that the whole problem here is that the legislature was insufficiently precise in its language when it wrote the statute? You mean if they'd, if they'd just had, the, if they'd had you to call the Law Revision Commission then we wouldn't have this problem because they would have said, oh yeah, let's include the same-sex couples? Well, no, Your Honor. I don't think anybody was thinking about this in 1909 when the domestic relations law was created. However, what's very significant is this. There is no prohibition under New York State law against same-sex marriage. There are only two qualifications for two people to be married. One is age, and the second is the capability of consent. And if a person is of sufficient age, and if that person is capable of consenting to a marriage, then, as the law is written, and apply, yes, but implying the rules of construction, they are entitled to be married. But doesn't that, doesn't that uh, suggest uh, maybe an argument for the other side, that for a long, long, long time, it was not only believed, it was just assumed without even thinking that only people of opposite sexes could marry. I mean, that's not true of race. We had racial discrimination laws all over the place. Well, Your Honor. Nobody, nobody even thought it was necessary to limit marriage to, uh, to opposite sex couples, but it seemed so obvious for all those years. I mean, have you, can you think of a case where something that was that well accepted for that many centuries was found unconstitutional? I think that when you have rules of construction which have been clearly defined by this court and where it is the obligation of the court and the offices of the court to attempt to uh, uh, interpret a law so as to avoid constitutional problems. And we've been talking about constitutional problems. If we follow that maxim, then under those circumstances, if we avoid the constitutional problems, if we employ the rules of construction, if we say that for statutory language purposes, male is female and female is male, then in New York State, Your Honor, where there is no prohibition against same-sex marriage, even though there have been several efforts in the last couple of years to pass legislation to forbid same-sex marriage, as many, 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 I think most of the other states which have considered same-sex marriage have done, New York State, despite many opportunities to do so, has declined to do so. I understand also, your point. In matter of Jacob, we did that. We did exactly what you're asking us to do here. In matter of Jacob, we, but we weren't statute. changing words in the statute. 
Well, Your Honor, what we can under the rules of construction, and I think that it is an appropriate well, we, thing it, to we do. We really do come right up against the constitutional issue, Mr. Kenlin, don't we? Well, if we need whether to. Whether we do it frontally if, or whether we do it in some more subversive way, as you're Well, suggesting. subversive is an interesting choice of words, and actually it's one of the words that I've liked all my life, Your Honor, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let you end with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kenlin. Thank you very much. Massachusetts is the only state that currently allows same-sex marriages. For more information on the proposed constitutional amendment, President Bush's statements, and debate from the Senate floor, go to cspan.org. And join us next week for part two of the oral argument from New York's highest court. We'll hear from the attorneys arguing against gay marriage. America and the Courts, Saturday evenings at 7 Eastern on C-SPAN. Tonight on American Perspectives, commencement speeches from colleges and universities around the country, and later, a discussion on journalists under fire, what happens in a newsroom when one of their own becomes the story. That's all ahead tonight on American Perspectives. Yale University holds its traditional class day the day before the official commencement ceremony. Class day is an informal ceremony to celebrate Yale traditions and hand out student awards. This year's class day speaker was CNN's Anderson Cooper, who graduated from Yale in 1989. This is nearly 20 minutes. Thank you, Trey.